So now we've seen what the moment of inertia is, let's have a look at how to calculate it for a few different shapes. So let's start with the simple case of two masses, both mass m and each a distance r from the pivot point about which the system turns. So in this case, because we've got discrete masses rather than a continuous mass, we're assuming here that this bar is massless, we can say, well, I, the moment of inertia, is equal to the sum over lowercase i, mi, ri squared, which in this case, we've just got the two masses, both at the same radius r. So this is equal to mr squared plus mr squared, which is all equal to 2mr squared. So that is how we calculate the moment of inertia of two point masses. Now let's consider a rod. A rod is a little bit more complicated because it is a continuous mass distribution. We've got mass all the way along the rod. So we're going to make the assumption for our rod that it has a constant linear density. So the linear density is the same all the way along the rod. Now, linear density, we tend to represent in physics by the symbol lambda, and it is literally the mass of the rod. So if I weighed my ruler on the scales and got that mass, that mass divided by the length of the rod. So in this case, it's a meter ruler. So that length would be one meter. So lambda is equal to m on L. Okay, so what we'll need to do in this case is use our formula to calculate the moment of inertia. We'll be using i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. And if this rod is pivoted about one end, we'll be breaking our meter ruler, in this case, up into little increments, each with length dl and mass dm. And then we'll be summing up those increments all along the rod to get our total moment of inertia. So we'll do that in a minute. When it comes to calculating the moment of inertia from the rod pivoted about its center, we take a similar approach, except in this case, the r in the equation refers to the distance from the pivot point. So it's a distance, it doesn't have a sign. So here is the same as here in our equations. So when we pivot it from the middle, we'll be summing up the contributions from this part and we'll be summing up the contributions from this part and then just summing those together. So let's have a look at the maths of how we approach this now. Okay, so we're considering a rod which is pivoted about one end like this. So in our formula for the moment of inertia, i is equal to the integral of r squared dm, r represents the distance from the pivot point. So this is our pivot axis here. So this end here is at r equals zero, and this end here is at r equals l if our rod has a length l, which we're assuming it does. And we'll let the rod have a mass m. Now, what we want to do is approach this question much like we approach the center of mass problem. So what we'll do is consider a little increment of the rod here. So we'll let this little increment have a length dr and a mass dm, and it is a distance r from our pivot point. And we want to work out, well, how does this little bit contribute to the moment of inertia? Well, it contributes a little bit. So the little bit it contributes is di, and that is equal to its distance from the pivot point squared. So this is r squared, not dr. dr is the length of the increment, but in our moment of inertia formula here, this term is referring to the distance from the pivot point. So that's an r squared, there's no dr there. And then it's times the mass of this little increment. And we've said, well, that little increment has a mass dm. So this is how much that little increment contributes to the moment of inertia. So now if we want to work out the total moment of inertia along the rod, what we're going to need to do is sum together all of these little increments. So we will then have, well, i is equal to the integral of r squared dm. And in this case, we're summing from one end of the rod, which is at r equals zero, up to the other end of the rod, which is at r equals l. 
and now we've got this r squared dm in here which is a bit inconvenient to deal with because we've got a dm and an r and how does r relate to dm we'd need to know that in order to be able to solve this integral so in order to work out how they relate and useful quantity is the linear density so the linear density has the symbol lambda and this is the linear density and it is equal to the mass divided by the length so we've got both the mass and the length in this case now there's a couple of other densities that you will come across in physics we've got a surface density which is represented by sigma which is equal to the mass divided by the area. And then we've got our usual density, which you've seen before, rho. This is equal to the volume density. And it is equal to the mass divided by the volume. But the one we want to use right now is lambda is equal to m on l. And how this helps is, well, that lets us come up with the amount of mass that little increment dr has. So we can write, well, the mass of something, just rearranging this formula, is equal to lambda times L. So that tells us that the mass of our little increment is equal to lambda times the length of our increment, which we've said is dr. So now we've got a relationship between dm and dr. Now, in this case, we were assuming that our rod had a uniform density, so lambda is just a constant. It is possible to get questions where lambda is varying. So if a rod is getting, say, thicker as you move along its length, then it will get heavier as you move along its length. And lambda could be some function of the distance from the pivot point r instead of just a constant. But we'll just stick to the nice case where it is constant. So what we want to do now is substitute this expression here into here. So we end up with i is equal to the integral and our integral is now we've still got our r squared but we're going to replace dr, sorry, we're going to replace dm with lambda dr and our limits are from r equals 0 to r equals l and that's good now our limits are in terms of this variable here, the dr, so that's what we wanted. Now, because lambda is just a constant, we can pull it out the front of our integral. So we have lambda times the integral from 0 to L of r squared dr. So we have lambda. Now, integrating r squared, we have r cubed on 3, and we're going from 0 to L. So this is equal to lambda times L cubed on 3. When we substitute in the 0, we just end up with 0. Okay, so that's a fairly nice expression, but we can make it a little bit nicer by looking up the top here. We said lambda was equal to m on l. So I'm going to replace this lambda now with m on l. So I've got m on l times l cubed on 3. So these l's cancel and I end up with m l squared on 3. So i equals m l squared on 3 is the moment of inertia of a rod which is pivoted about one end. Okay, let's now consider the same rod. Here we go. It's still got length l, still got a uniform um, linear density, lambda, which is equal to m on l. But now I want to pivot about the middle. So this is at r equals 0. Here I've got r is equal to l on 2. Here I've also got r is equal to l on 2. Now I don't put this as minus l on 2 because in my moment of inertia formula up here, r refers to the distance from the pivot point. It's not the displacement. It doesn't depend on the direction. It's just the distance. So the distance is the same, l on 2. So what I'm going to do here is split my rod into two halves. I've got green half there and here's the orange half. And I know that the I total will be equal to I1. Let's call this one I1 and this one I2. So I'll just work out what these two things are. So I1 
1, that's going to be the integral of r squared dm, and we're going from r is equal to 0 to r is equal to l on 2. So it's going from here to here. Now we do it exactly the same way. We consider these little increments, and the little increments here have exactly the same mass as the little increments up here because it's exactly the same rod. So once again, I can replace this dm with this same expression here, the lambda dr. So once again, I'll have a lambda dr here. And then I can pull lambda out the front. So I've got lambda times r squared dr, and I'm going from 0 to L on 2. And when I integrate, I'll replace lambda with m on L. And then I've got r cubed on 3 from 0 to L on 2. So this is equal to m over L. And now I'm putting L on 2 cubed. So this is L cubed over 2 cubed, which is 8 times, I've still got this 3 here, 3, and then when I put in the 0, it's just 0 again. So this is equal to ml cubed on L times 24, or ml squared on 24. So that was I1, I2. Now, I'm once again going from 0 to L on 2. The density and everything is exactly the same, so I end up with exactly the same integral here, I squared dm from 0 to L on 2. And so when I do the same integral with the same limits, I end up with the same answer. So that's ml squared on 24. And so this tells me that the total i is equal to ml squared on 24 plus ml squared on 24. So when I double ml squared on 24, I end up with ml squared on 12. Okay, so I have now calculated the total moment of inertia about a rod which is pivoted at the center. So notice how it is quite different. I had this one for a rod pivoted at one end and this one for a rod pivoted at the center. And let's just check that it's logical. If we're pivoted at one end, then we've got more mass which is further from the pivot axis. And we were saying before, if we had more mass which was further from the pivot point, we would expect the moment of inertia to be higher because it would be harder to turn this object. And indeed, ml squared on 3 is higher than ml squared on 12. It's also worthwhile just to check that we've got the units that we expect. For a moment of inertia, we expect it to be a mass and a distance squared. And both of these contain a mass and a distance squared. So they look pretty good. And they are, in fact, the correct expressions for a rod pivoted about one end and a rod pivoted about the center.